Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for, for the nice introduction. So let's move and start with this uh, fantastic uh, session. And I'm going to talk, as Dr. Ahmed said, about the, the analysis, molecular analysis of the products of conception. And uh, well, uh, let's start from obviously the very beginning and with the introduction and to say that as you all know, the incidence of spontaneous clinical abortion in the general population is around 15%. Uh, the most of them, it around 80%, occurs or happens before the 12th week of gestation, which we can consider as a biological barrier. And also, the chromosomal abnormalities are the most frequent cause for those uh, spontaneous clinical abortion. These chromosomal abnormalities or aneuploidies are alteration in the number of chromosomes that ca can cause this spontaneous abortion or newborns with a chromosomopathy. We do know that in more than 50% of the miscarriage in the first trimester uh, are the result of chromosomal abnormalities. And this could increase up to 60% among women who have undergone assisted reproduction treatment. So despite knowing a multitude of etiological factors, some abortions remain of a known cause. We know different causes that could be genetics, immunological, either autoimmune with the antiphospholipid syndrome or alloimmune with the uh, killer immunoglobulin receptors, could be anatomical cause, endocrinological cause like corpus luteum insufficiency, PCOS, diabetes, but treatment of the diabetes, also could be a cause hematological with a non antiphospholipid thrombophilias, could be a cause of an infection, like for instance, chronic endometritis or other infections caused by pathogens, uh, like Garnerella, for instance, Prebotella or Atopovium, uh, could be a problem with the microbiome of the endometrium that can cause also miscarriage, even the obesity could be a possibility. But I'm going to focus in this talk about the part that uh, it's more interesting for us that is the chromosomes. So in this study of the group of Robinson, they analyzed uh, first miscarriage in a patient and then same patient had a second miscarriage and observed the results. As you can see, the result at the first miscarriage, they found almost 60% of those were normal duplicate results. And when the same patient had a second miscarriage, those ones was increased in 20% more. So then a second miscarriage of the same patient was 20% more chances to be duploid. But on the other side, when a patient had a first miscarriage as aneuploid, the chance to have a second miscarriage that it's aneuploid again, it's 20% higher as well. And how do you have to perform the analysis of products of conception? Uh, the miscarriages. So this is a paper that is really, really important and is really interesting for me because it checks not only for the clinical part, but also for the part of economics. Because we do know that there's a lot of patients that cannot afford certain types of analysis because uh, the money. So let's check how this paper works. So this first show to us how is the results of the classical ISRM evaluation with the patients, the regular workup with patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. They analyzed 100 patients and what they observed is that they got 55% of patients that were normal and 45% that were abnormal in this RPL workup. In this 45%, they found 4% with uh, parental karyotypes, so they did genetic counseling for those patients. 19% had an abnormal anatomic evaluation, so they target a surgical correction. 9% has had an abnormal endocrinologic evaluation, so they target a medical correction. And 17%, they have uh, bad autoimmune factors, so they uh, treat it with aspirin, heparin, calcium, and vitamin D. So there's three different strategies to identify the cause of uh, the recurrent pregnancy loss. 
So you can follow the ASRM RPL World Cup that we just saw in the uh, previous slide. You can perform a product of conception uh, analysis that I'm going to show you in, in, this, in this talk. Or you can do both. You can combine and do the ASRM RPL World Cup plus the molecular analysis of the products of conception. And if you combine both, you can find the cause of the miscarriage in 95% of the cases. But it is the same to start with uh, the ASRM workup for RPL or starting with the uh, chromosomal analysis of the products of conception. So let's check at the level of the um, different approaches. So let's see first, if you perform first the RPL workup, if you do first the RPL workup, we are gonna have a cost of these 100 patients of 330K talking about, about US dollars. Well, we can obtain results either normal or abnormal. And if we have a result as abnormal, we already finished it. The, co the total cost for those kind of patients is it's going to be 150K K US dollars. But is, if a patient is normal with the RPL ASRM World Cup, you have to perform the 24 chromosome analysis. So then you have to add extra 38K. And at the end, those kind of patients that were normal for the RPL World Cup, and then you perform the chromosomal analysis, will have a cost of 220K. So at the end, the total cost for the patient would be 367K US dollars. Let's do the opposite. So let's first from the analysis of the products of conception, the molecular analysis of the products of conception. So this is gonna have a cost for the uh, 100 patients of 70K, okay? If we have an abnormal result, we uh, already found the situation of those patients. But if uh, we have a result as a normal euploid, then we have to perform the ASRM RPL workup and we have to add an extra cost of 110K. So we will obtain a total cost for those individuals as 130K and the total of all the patients being analyzed would be 178K US dollars. So you can compare, if you started doing the ASRM RPL workup and then perform the chromosomal analysis, you will have 367K. If you start, with the chromosomal analysis, you will reduce this almost to the half. So this would be the first choice, do chromosomal analysis. And this is what they propose. If they, ha they have a first miscarriage, there's no action taken unless clinical indicated. But at the second miscarriage, they will obtain the products of conception and they will analyze it uh, with a platform for the 24 chromosomes. If the results are unemployed, there's no further evaluation. You already found the problem. If there's obtainers in the process of conception and unbalanced chromosomal translocation or inversion, you perform parental karyotypes. And if you have a euploid products of conception result, then they will follow with the RPL World Cup for the ASRM. So as we can observe in the different studies of uh, classical cytogenetics in spontaneous miscarriage, as we said before, we will have around 50% that will be abnormal being 95% de novo numerical abnormalities. But the problem with the classical cytogenetic studies is that uh, there's a cell culture failure in around 42% of the cases and 30% of the cases could be a false negative result due to maternal cell contamination. So when a normal regular karyotype is telling us normal, we don't know if it comes from fetus or from the mother. So this is an example, and you can compare doing conventional karyotyping for the miscarriages or for the products of conception versus performing NGS, the products of conception analysis for the 24 chromosomes. Conventional karyotype requires in vitro cell culture. NGS doesn't require cell culture um, uh, for the analysis. You extract the DNA directly. Conventional karyotype, you have results in one month, and you have results in 10 days when you perform an NGS approach. In conventional karyotype, results obtained in around 60% of the cases, 
we will obtain in 99% of the cases by NGS. In conventional karyotype, you will have around 30% of the cases with false negatives, as we said before. There's no false negative results due to maternal cell contamination, and we will explain why. And you have lower resolution analysis in conventional karyotype versus same or even higher resolution performing NGS. As an indication, we can perform uh, this kind of test in couples with recurrent miscarriage or previous aneuploid conception. Also, we can perform in infertile couples undergoing assisted reproductive treatments because we said before that up to 60% of those couples will have an aneuploid uh, miscarriage. Also, couples with severe mere factor, those couples when the male has a severe oligospermia with le less than two million per milliliter of spermatozoa, they can have also more uh, miscarriages that are unemployed. And also, it's, it has been described, couples with env environmental exposure to endocrine disruptors, either the male or the female. So I'm going to show you this study that uh, it was an oral presentation at the ASRM in Vienna 2019, when we analyzed 2,500 uh, products of conception and we did different analysis. We analyzed the different molecular techniques, RACGH and NGS. We analyzed also what happens with uh, the maternal age, different uh, process with the different maternal age. We also check for the gestational age. It obviously, it's not the same when you have a miscarriage on the sixth week, on the 10th week, or over the 12th week. And also, how about the oocyte origin? And so what we perform is once we receive the products of conception, we perform three day section. We ask also for uh, EDTA blood tube coming from the uh, mother. And I will explain to you later on why. And then with the DNA of the three dissections, we perform either the RACGH or the NGS analysis for this study. And if needed, we perform the STR analysis, the shorthand and repeat analysis. This is a regular protocol for the NGS. Then when we finalize, we will obtain these kind of profiles. We can have a, a euploid a female profile on top of the image. On the, in the medium, we can observe a monosomy 45X that you will see that it's the most prevalent monosomy that we can find in a, in a probes of conception, usually around between eight to 9% of the cases of miscarriage in the first three instant and the, are because monosomy 45X. And also you can see on the uh, below of the, of the picture, a trisomy for chromosome uh, 15, that it's also one of the most prevalent trisomies that we find in the, in the miscarriages. But what happened if we see uh, this kind of result, euploid, even XX or XY? So then we need to check for the STRs. And this is why we ask for the blood of the, of the mother in order to discard or rule out maternal cell contamination or polyploidies. You can observe on the top of the image, the maternal sample. We extracted the, the DNA and we obtain from the blood of the mother these uh, this, uh, peaks or alleles. And on the bottom, we have uh, the, the sample of the, uh, it's supposed to be the fetus. And I'm telling you that it's supposed to be the fetus because you can see, you can observe that all the peaks or the alleles are coincident. That this means that the result from the bottom, it's not coming from the fetus, but from the mother. So this uh, would be a result of maternal cell contamination. In this other example, you can observe that some of the peaks or the alleles are coincident obviously, because we inherit those from the mother's side, but also we have others that are not coincident with the maternal sample because we inherit from the father. So this is, and this is the sample that we are going to run on the NGS because we do know for sure that it's coming from the fetus and not coming from the mother. Even we can check for polyploidy, you will see in these STRs a pattern with two or three peaks if it's uh, mostly goes one or two peaks, uh, if it's a mostly goes or heterozygous goes, but in those cases, you can, we can observe even three peaks. And this means that this miscarriage happened because uh, triploidy. Also, we can check for the gender of this triploidy because you observe two peaks, peak for the X and peak for the Y. The peak for the Y, it's almost double than the peak, uh, peak for the X. This means that has the double of the DNA from chromosome Y than from chromosome X. And this uh, miscarriage happened because a triploidy 69X 
YY. So let's move into the results of our study. And you can see that first, as, as I said, we analyzed the different uh, molecular techniques, RCGH versus uh, next generation sequencing. And we didn't have any differences between uh, the statistical difference between the results. So from now and further, we will put all the results together and we will check the total results. As you can see, we, we had uh, in this uh, 200 and uh, 500 um, POC analysis, 99% of informative cases, but we need to know that almost 13% of the cases were maternal cell contamination. That, that means that on the three different uh, samples, we didn't find any sample that comes from the fetus. And we obtained 53.5% of abnormal results that it's more or less the same that we observed in previous studies. Results by chromosomes. You can observe that even though that monosomies are not common in miscarriage, the most common monosomy that we found, it's obviously for chromosome X, even more 45X uh, or X0 in almost 85% of the cases. But uh, although with very low frequency, the monosomy 21 was the one of the highest incidence as has been described in different studies. We also found monosomies for chromosome 13 and 22. And as far as we know, it was the first time that monosomies for chromosome 4 and 15 were reported in a product of conception. Talking about trisomies, uh, this follow a pattern similar previously published studies with higher incidence for chromosomes 16 and 22 with almost 16, 17% followed by, by chromosomes 15, 13 and 21. So let's check the results by maternal age. As you can see here, if we have patients that are under 35 years old, they, we should expect abnormal results in around 45, 50% of the cases. If we move in patients between 36 and 40 years old, those results, abnormal results, should be between 60 and 65%. And if the patient has between 41 and 42 years old, this increases up to 70%. But we observe that over 42 years old, this was down to 50%. And we think that this is a limitation of our technique. We think that in this group, it comes some of the patients with an egg donation program that they fill it properly. So, uh, because it's obvious that this trend should be higher and patients over 42 years old should be increased more than even 70%. So if we uh, check for the multiple anepody, we see that patients lower than uh, 40 years old or 38 years old was between four, four to 6% in the, in the column in blue. But after 39 years old, it's going to increase uh, each time it's going to be uh, higher, this percentage of multiple anepoides. If we uh, focus on the sex monosomy and polyploidy, it tend to decrease with the maternal age. Let's move into the gestational age. As you can see, the lower the gestational age, the bigger the material cont maternal contamination, obviously, because the lower the gestational age, we do have less amount of sample in order to get the DNA coming from the fetus. If we talk about the abnormal results, you can see that uh, those uh, miscarriages happens before the ninth week, would be around 50% of the cases would be abnormal. In between ninth week of gestation and 12th week of gestation would be between 60 and 65%. But then when you move over uh, the 12th week, those, this biological barrier that we uh, talked before, it went down from the 65, 60% to 34%. So would be almost the half. How about oocyte origin? We can observe that the percentage of aneuploidy was higher in miscarriage with on oocytes compared to egg donation cycles. Obviously, 55% versus 30%. But if you take a look to the sex monosomy, this kind of aneuploidy, uh, we observe that from 9% in patients with on oocyte, it was 37% in patients uh, with donated oocyte. And it, this is because it has been described that around 80% of cases with a monosomy for the sexual chromosomes, it is due to the absence of paternal sexual chromosome, unlike the aneuploidies of the autosomes that are mostly of maternal origin. And this is the cause that we think that uh, it's increased the number 
or the percentage of sex monosomy in those kind of couples. I'm almost finalizing, so what we do suggest when you have a free trimester miscarriage is to perform an analysis of the paradox of conception with the uh, maternal uh, blood. So then you will perform the diagnostic by the NGS, and if it is normal, then you will perform the STRs. The STRs will tell you if there's maternal cell contamination or no maternal cell contamination. And this is, if this is not maternal cell contamination, then you go for the etiologic diagnosis. But if you perform the NGS and it is abnormal, then if it's a numerical abnormality, you can go through different stages, such as uh, to perform a PGTA or uh, perform uh, uh, to change uh, the gametes, or you can perform an NIPT that Dr. Miguel will, will tell you more later on. But if you find a structural abnormality, then you can suggest to the parent to perform a cytogenetic analysis. If it is the novel abnormality, you go for the first part. But if it is an inherited abnormality, then you can suggest to go through PET, SR, change of gametes, or do a prenatal test. So uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, it's really important to perform a POC analysis to give an explanation to the patient why the pregnancy loss has happened if it is abnormal. If it is normal, then we know that we will have to focus on another possible cause that is not chromosomal, either endometrial, endocrine, immunological, or thrombophilic. Uh, also, we can provide best reproductive advice for a future cycle, whether it's trying the patients to get pregnant naturally at home or going through assisted reproductive uh, treatments. And knowing that the majority of miscarriages are due to chromosomal causes, and that once we have a chromosomal abnormality, the probability of having another abnormal abortion increases as we observe, we consider the importance of this type of st study and thus be able to assess whether to refer the patient to a reproductive endocrinologist. To conclude, I would say that molecular technique, techniques such as NGS combined with the use of STRs make it possible to increase the efficiency of the analysis of chromosomal abnormalities of products of conception compared to conventional cytogenetic techniques, improving the percentage of samples with informative results and reducing the rate of false negatives caused by contamination with maternal DNA. And that's all. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I will be ready for the uh, questions in the, in the last session Q&A. Thank you very much. Shukran. So hello everyone. And um, well, my name is Miguel Milan and in the next 20 minutes, this is a pleasure. First of all, uh, this is a pleasure to be here uh, this evening with you uh, to share some knowledge and some ideas about prenatal diagnosis and prenatal screening. And in the next uh, 20 minutes, uh, we are talking about prenatal screening. Um, and I want first thing first, I think um, everybody agrees that the, the best uh, genetic analysis that we can perform is the one that we can get from the invasive uh, testing. So meanwhile, amniocentesis or CVS, I think that everybody knows that the quality and the quantity of DNA that we can get from an invasive uh, technique, um, the, the amount of different techniques that we can use to perform specific um, analysis is the wider one. So, uh, but why we don't apply, why we don't uh, um, uh, prescribe um, amniocentesis for all the pregnant women? The reason is you know in most of the places is economical so uh, you know uh, we cannot afford an amniocentesis for every uh, single woman first and second is the second reason is because it's not for free so we know that the amniocentesis that the invasive testing um, meanwhile uh, amniocentesis or cvs um, has a, a you know a risk for abortion is not high is low is between one in one thousand one in one hundred something like that but you have a risk uh, of miscarriage, of uh, involuntary uh, spontaneous miscarriage. So this is the reason why uh, from the beginning, um, many researchers decided to uh, look for the specific uh, forms of ways to, uh, to uh, estimate an this or problem during the, the pregnancy. At the beginning, we started with the chromosome 21, but later on different groups and different uh, researchers, uh, well, uh, they improve 
improved the levels of detections, uh, classifying better and better the, the, the patients in high risk or low risk in order to, uh, to um, uh, recommend an amniocentesis and including new, uh, new uh, chromosomes, not only chromosome 21, but also chromosomes 13 and chromosome 18. This is a slide, a slide in, uh, in, you can see in here uh, how is beautifully um, summarized the different manners, the different ways in which you can, um, up to 2011, before the C uh, cell free DNA age, uh, how was managed uh, the combined screening or the, the screening uh, in the first trimester and you can and in the second trimester and you can combine many different, different things using ultrasound and different biochemical markers to get the best um, the best chances, the best detection rate and the lower false positive rates. But you can see that in the best of the cases, the detection rate could reach something about 95% and the false positive rate uh, 2.5. But the reality is that the most common uh, uh, screening used so far uh, in many, many places around the world, the, the, the what, worldwide used is the combined screening. And in general, using the combined screening uh, is well known, well described that about uh, 19 out of 20 amniocentesis returns a normal result. That, in other words, means that we have a positive predictive value of about 5%. In, sorry. In, uh, um, so in, this is the evolution in the timeline. And from 2011, we started, we were able to analyze uh, the cell-free DNA testing. And this was a, a complete revolution in the prenatal world. Okay, in the prenatal diagnosis and prenatal screening world. So you can see in here a comparison. This is only for chromosome 21, but you can guess that this could be applied for all the rest of conditions. Uh, the levels of detections for the, uh, for the Down syndrome, they were good, but they were, you know, the sky rocketed the, the levels of detection with numbers that were very close to 100%. You can realize that there is in medicine uh, some diagnostic techniques that don't have this level of detection that, that the one that we can achieve with the uh, self-free DNA for, for this kind of a screening with a low positive, false positive rate, as low as the one that you can see in this, in this slide. And at the end, this, this drives us to, uh, you know, the possibility to reduce, to focus, to narrow the number of women uh, to which we classify as high risk and recommend an amniocentesis returning normal results. And in this article from Bianchi and colleagues in 2014, they described that about 89% uh, of all women, if they perform a cell free DNA, uh, could have a reduction in the amniocentesis about this figure. Okay. This is our experience in our genomics. So in our genomics, if we consider only the high risk population when they perform this, this risk uh, assessment by combined screening, and then we perform the NITT. We, we, we reduce, we get 95.6% of all the results normal. So this is the amount of uh, reduction of amniocentesis that we, that we see, we observe, okay? Okay, next point I want to deal in with in this presentation is something related with uh, marketing and technology, because I think this is of paramount, paramount importance to be clear about uh, certain things. So uh, is the NIPT a good technique? Yes, there is a fight between different technology platforms to discuss which one is better. Yes, it is. So and you are experiencing this for, for sure. But the reality, we have to be clear, the reality is that all NIPT platforms have similar test performance for common conditions, okay? And what is important is that all NIPT platforms have their own limitations, and since it's super important for the laboratory providing the services, and for you, you have to, this is my humble opinion, but you have to be pro proactive and you have to look for this uh, aspect, for this point. So, you have to see if you can test or not, or if you want to test or not to low fetal fraction, in low fetal fraction conditions, uh, if the test can or not uh, test with, in cases when couples with consanguinity, one is in twin pregnancies, in twin pregnancies and donations, uh, in case of triplody, if you suspect that you have a triplody in your pregnancy, uh, if your technique is good or not, if uh, the couple, one of the members of the couple, has an abnormal karyotype, if you 
can test with the platform that you are currently uh, using or you are thinking in using, etc. Another point, another important point is to discuss about the technology. So the technology, if the laboratory is prescribing or is giving you the, the service, uh, has a technology transfer and can pro produce or, or process the sample in their facilities. Or if this is a laboratory sending out the, the samples abroad to other country, because uh, this is directly impacting the TAT, the turnaround time, the amount of time that you, you, uh, you know, you need to get the result. And this could be tricky in cases of special cases when you need you know, to be fast. And then you have to think about if you want to test for basic conditions, only for chromosome 21, 13, 18, or if you want to expand to uh, different conditions. And this is quite important because, because you know, not all the countries are exactly the same. And the reality is that the idiosyncrasy of your country uh, and my country and any country around the world is different. And the menu, the things that you can test uh, with an IPT, uh, you know, is increasing year by year. So you can start anal analyzing only three or five chromosomes with the basic panels. You can add uh, all 24 anaplodes, trisomies, or even monosomies. Or you can test for a small panel of micro deletions or for big panels of micro deletions. Or you can test for any copy number variations, any duplication or deletion that is greater than five to seven megabases. Uh, with other kind of NIPTs, you can test for many, you know, you can screen for many de novo single gene disorders or for some recessive single gene disorders. Or you can, if you have a, a specific uh, condition, uh, a specific risk in a family with a single gene disorder, you can, uh, you know, uh, use or analyze, analyze this, uh, this risk in the pregnancy with bespoke uh, procedures. So it's quite important to know about your idiosyncrasy, uh, when the pregnancy can be terminated or not. In our case, for example, we know that in your case, you cannot terminate the pregnancy uh, beyond the 19th uh, week of pregnancy. So we, we is quite similar to the Spanish uh, regulation. So in this, in those cases, we, we tend to, to, you know, speed up to prioritize all the analysis for prenatal because, you know, uh, you, you have to be fast in these cases. This is just an example of how it's working, for example, in Spain. In Spain, I don't know if this is similar or not to your system, but we have a public health system and, and, a, private, and a private one, okay? So in the case of the public health system, they tend to use this contingent approach in which they uh, look for cost effectivity. So why? Because they have a limited budget and they uh, cannot afford the analysis for all the patients that they have. So the only patients that are included in the NIPT program are, are those with intermediate risk, okay? It's high risk, but between one in 2,170 to one in uh, 50, okay? Greater than that, uh, they proceed uh, direct, directly to amniocentesis, and with less than one in 2,070, they don't, they don't do anything. They consider this as low risk and they don't do anything. But the reality is that in the private system, you can do it by cost efficiency or you can do it by effectivity. And the reality is that you can uh, find a lot of different articles in the literature. This is just an example in which you can see that there is nothing better to classify patients as high risk or low risk in all kinds of patients, low risk patients and average patients in high risk patients than the cell free DNA that the NIPT. This is a reality. And this is an example. And here, for example, in this article, you have tenfold better detection rate for trisomy 21 using the cell-free DNA than using the, the, uh, the combined screening. So what you are doing by doing this, if patient can afford the test, is that in low-risk patients, you can improve the scapes because in here, one in 2017 is going to have a, a Down syndrome for sure. And in high risk patients, you are going to reduce the invasive procedures, okay? So this is another example in Spain and is how the evolution of the NIPT uh, for basic, basic conditions uh, versus the extended ones. And it was stable from year to year, but we have realized that last year in 2019 and in 2020, there is an evolution, an increased number of extended 
uh, uh, panels or extended and IPPs requested. And we think that the reason for this, although the extended conditions are not uh, are not recommended by any guidelines so far, but the reality is that the amount of information articles, you know, the, the literature, the scientific literature is growing. And the doctors uh, find and understand what they are analyzing and the importance of analyzing uh, uh, extended things, extended conditions during this period of time to classify better the, the patients in high risk or low risk. Um, this is just an example. This is just an example that we had like two months ago in which we performed uh, an extended panel for all 24 chromosomes plus CMVs. We can visualize CMVs. Uh, this is an ideogram of the chromosome 18 and you can see in here different parts of the chromosome 18 represented. And in, grid, in this graph, it's exactly the same. So for normalcy, you, you must have all these uh, lines uh, in this part of the, of the graph. And you can see how, how this part of the chromosome, the P-arm of the chromosome 18, was increased, was in this part of the graph. So this is compatible with a duplication of 15 megabases in this part of the chromosome. Uh, if we pay attention only in the results, that we, we would have, uh, have have, uh, if we have, uh, or if a basic NAPT uh, was uh, um, prescribed, the result would be trisomy 18. But the result with the extended NAPT is that we have a partial duplication of chromosome 18. This is quite important because after this, with this result, we have to talk with the doctor and we have to guide or counsel the doctor and patients to, you know, for further analysis. In case you perform an array or an acaryotype, for sure you are going to get this. But in case, and this happens in many in many parts of, of the world, if the only thing that they do is a FIS with a rapid prenatal or a QF-PCR, perhaps if they select uh, props in this part of the chromosome, they are going to see normalcy and this is what they are going to disclose to the patient. And this alteration must be masked, okay? And this is important why the standard two conditions they are important because you know, uh, we can include with these extended conditions a new population that were not included in the past, that is the structural balance alterations in the karyotype. So I mean translocations for reciprocal, reversionian, inversions, we can include in this part. And we are going to include this in the next future, not right now, but in the next future, uh, this, this population. Why? Because it's quite prevalent. So you can see that the prevalence, for example, for instance, for the reciprocal translocation population, is 0.2, in other words, one in 500 people. In other words, one in 250 couples. In, and they are uh, uh, couples at risk of having miscarriages first, but then they could have, uh, uh, you know, uh, an ongoing pregnancy with congenital birth defects or, or, or different things, different kind of clinical conditions, okay? And this risk could be even greater, up to 25-fold, increase in the patients of IVF. So this is quite important. And this is another case, a uh, real case, that we faced that one, like one year ago, in which we observed for chromosome three, an increase in this part of the chromosome, in the terminal part of the chromosome three, and the three Q, and a deletion in the, in the 5P. So, uh, well, uh, the couple decided to perform uh, uh, an amniocentesis and they detected in the amniotic fluid the alteration for chromosome five. Uh, they were not able to detect the, the deletion uh, in the chromosome, sorry, the alteration in the chromosome three, but the, it was there. And uh, well, they recommended the parents to perform uh, a karyotype and they discovered, uh, uh, you know, a balanced uh, reciprocal, reciprocal translocation in the father. So they get two different information. The first one is a reason for the abortion because this was a spontaneous miscarriage. Later on, uh, this case was performed in Brazil. In Brazil is forbidden the, the termination of the pregnancy at any time. So they, they couldn't do anything, but they had a, res a, a, you know, a response for this abortion. And second, they could have a good genetic counseling, reproductive genetic counseling for future pregnancies, okay? Uh, then next, I want to go through different questions. There are frequent questions that we get, and I think it's, it's good to, to go through these for you and to discuss later on after the three talks. So the first one is how important is the fetal fraction estimation, estimation testing below 4% or not testing below uh, 4%. So 
there are technical point of views and biological point of views that I want to share with you. And the first is that the amount of data uh, in the scientific literature is scarce. Is very low. So, no, uh, and in addition, no companies gives specificities and sensitivities stratifying by range of fetal fraction. For example, I, I go I go to uh, different companies and I say, okay, what is your test performance, your metrics for uh, patients, and only for patients between two and four percent fetal fraction, or only for patients uh, between four and eight, or greater than twenty percent fetal fraction, and they don't disclose this information. They analyze all the patients all together as a whole so must we trust in what they say if they say that we can go below two percent uh, four percent fetal fraction is is that true so at the end you have to trust in the laboratory that you are working with in the laboratory experience uh, above all if this laboratory has worked with different technologies or they are receiving patients that has tests with other technologies and this is for example this is our case we are uh, analyzing with different technologies and we've receiving we are continuously receiving patients with non-informative results from other technologies to test uh, below four percent fetal fraction okay so uh, what is the the reason the reason is uh, our experience in which we can see that uh, below four four percent fetal fraction we detect the anomalies and we don't have uh, false negatives in a range uh, uh, to be to be uh, honest, we have a limit of fetal fraction is 2% fetal fraction, so we cannot release, we don't release any result with any fetal fraction. So this is our limit, but we know that below uh, 4%, uh, up to 2% fetal fraction, we can get trusted results because in all the experience and in all the casuistry that we have, we didn't face any false negative in that range. And second, because the statistic matters. And um, when you ask to the, the platform that you are using, in our case, we work with Illumina uh, in Spain, and we ask for the technology, and they explain to you that they are using an, an special algorithm in which they analyze the short fragments and the low fragments. And this will describe that the short fragments are enriched in fetal fraction, and the long fragments are enriched in maternal fraction. So they uh, uh, perform the analysis differently for both uh, kind of fragments in order to make a calling for an APLD. And then they don't disclose any kind of results uh, depending, you know, it, it's not the same at 2% fetal fraction or 4% fetal fraction or 10% fetal fraction. They have this kind of dynamic uh, analysis in which they combine the fetal fraction that they estimate and with the number of reads. It's not the same, and this is a, a statistical issue. This is something that is easy to understand. To get the statistical significance is not the same to analyze, uh, you know, a population of two people or to two million people. So you are going to read, you know, to be more concise, more precise with two million people that analyze only 10, 10 people. And it's the same in here. There are platforms that use, that uses uh, only, I don't know, thousands of are reads, uh, 10 to 5 million reads, and 25 million reads. And this is going to make easier to detect an at lower at the lower rates. Then the biological point of view. So uh, since the biologic, bi biological point of view, I want to mention the what, what is the reason for this low percent fetal fraction. And following the guidelines, uh, in general, what they recommend is a good ultrasound uh, sonographic examination and uh, invasive testing. But invasive testing for all the non-informatives due to low fetal fraction. So this is what is important to understand just everything in here. For example, the first thing is uh, important for twin pregnancies. Why? Because the limit must be the double. So whenever you have, for example, with one specific platform, 4% as a threshold for, for informativity, you have to think that in case of uh, twin pregnancies, you need eight, double, okay, to fall. So uh, this is important because this information is must must be used in the pre-test counseling in order for the patient to know what she expect about the informativity of the test. Okay, for this is uh, number one. Number two, to understand the causes and consequences of low fetal fraction. So it's not the same that the patient has a non-informative result with a four percent fetal or lower than four percent fetal fraction, and with a normal ultrasound examination and the patient is overweighted or, or if or, or uh, she is obese, okay? 
because perhaps most probably this is the reason why uh, the fetal uh, DNA is diluted. Or, for example, if the ultrasound is abnormal, in case the, the ultrasound is abnormal, you can see if the reason is that the placenta is small, if you can see malformations that, malformation that are compatible with trisomy 18, uh, or, or sorry, 18, 13, or if you can see, uh, you know, markers that can tell you that this is a degenic triplidy, because in those cases, the, the, the amniocentesis could be clearly uh, recommended. Uh, for example, you can see if your patient has a low fetal fraction and a non-informative result, and she has a normal ultrasound examination, is not over, overweighted, but she is using low molecular weight heparin. So there is controversy about if heparin could um, uh, lower the fetal fraction, but in case she is using this, you can contact us uh, just to see how, can how we can uh, deal with these kind of problems. Or you can see if the, the patient is normal weighted, is not obese, uh, don't use low uh, molecular weight heparin, whatever, but she has any immunological disorder, clinical condition or drug treatment causing cell death and an increase and diluting, diluting the, the uh, you know, you know uh, increasing the maternal cell-free uh, release, DNA release, and diluting the fetal one. So you can see that there are a lot of different scenarios and we have to, to uh, treat every one of them to decide if amniocentesis is recommended or not. Regarding vanishing twin pregnancies, there is a lot of controversies because, you know, if you look for vanishing twin pregnancies, uh, you can see that the literature is scarce, is very scarce, and the only thing that you can find mostly are uh, cases reports. And it, this is a well-known source of false positive results. And you can see that there is some controversy because this, this issue is not mentioned in, in many of the guidelines. And in some of the guidelines, one or two, uh, is not recommended to perform an IPT if you have a vanishing twin pregnancy. But the reality is that what is the alternative? So it's well described that in cases of vanishing twin pregnancy, the combined screening could be affected due to the vanishing twin. And the reality is that in our experience, uh, if you perform a proper management of the case and you treat this patient as a special case, you can get um, results as good as the one that you can get in a singleton pregnancy. And recently, we've published this article with more than 200 vanishing twin pregnancies compared to, sorry, can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, Miguel, but we Sorry. are in the... It's now? In the, okay. In, okay, perfect. Yeah, now. So, and, and, you know, compare with, with, I don't remember, with thousands of singleton pregnancies, and you can see how uh, specific procedures, how specific ways to manage these analyses can get you trusted results. So you cannot, you don't need to exclude these pregnancies from the analysis, and it's the better you can do. To, to manage properly the case and to get trusted results for the pregnancy, okay? And finally, I want to talk about the fetal placental genetic discrepancies because it's a well-known uh, source for false positives and false negatives, but it's uh, very important to, to know that this happens. Uh, it's very important in the pretest counseling to talk with patient and say that this is a biological factor that we cannot advance and uh, could be a result. So this classification with the NIPT is the best choice to date, but uh, you know, in some cases, in less than 1% of the cases, but in some cases you can have discrepancies that could give you a result that is not a false, a true positive or a true negative. negative. In, this, in this sense, uh, I want to point out the importance of concordant results using the NIPT plus the ultrasound. I think that this is the better choice. So better than the combined screening, better than anything else. So this is what is going to get you, to give you the better results and the better classification in high risk or low risk for your patients in order to uh, recommend or not doing something else, uh, you know, uh, during the pregnancy. It's very important, in addition, uh, the understanding of the biology of what is found. So you know that the, for the NIPT, you can test for by basic conditions, but you can test for the, all the 24 chromosomes, CMVs, micro deletions, whatever. But the behavior of every single chromosome and every single genetic condition is, is you know, is unique, and they behave in a different way. 
And this is important for the laboratory that is prescribing the test to uh, consult you and consult the patient if needed about this, uh, this uh, matter, okay? And, and knowing very well what is the positive predictive value regarding the literature we have so far. And finally, and this is the, the almost a couple of final slides, is to talk about single gene disorders, because this is something that I think is the next future is coming. A uh, few laboratories in the world are performing this kind of analysis, but I think that this is super interesting. And, and for example, you can test uh, in some in some places, in some laboratories, up to you know uh, you, you can detect for de novo uh, mutations or for uh, those mutations, these mutations in, in these genes when they uh, they are inherited from the father. Uh, you can detect up to 44 mutations in 25 different genes. You, you have an, a listing here. And in addition, you can you can get in some in some laboratories, uh, you can test non-invasively uh, for the most common uh, you know recessive conditions, as you can see in this in this box in here. And this in a couple of weeks, so with a good TAT uh, for the pregnancy. And in addition, uh, for for you know for other conditions not included in those panels, you can test for any any almost any condition uh, different. In, in gene disorders whenever you can uh, prepare the case and you have time enough to, prefer, to prepare, to study the self DNA and the fathers and to study, you know, a patient with the, uh, the condition with, with bespoke uh, analysis. Uh, the main laboratories doing this are located in the United Kingdom. You can see in here with these keywords that we have like 64 um, uh, different articles describing this. Uh, the reality is that it's amazing because they get uh, amazing sensitivity and sensibility, and this is just that doing diagnosis non-invasively. So this is fantastic, and this is my last slide. And with this, I give the floor to to Doctor. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you again for inviting me for this for this webinar, and I give the floor to Doctor Javier Garcia Planes for the invasive part. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Miguel. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Jafer uh, Garcia Planales. He is uh, currently the Clinical Development and Scientific Advisor, uh, Genomic Precision Diagnostic Director of iGenomics. And the topic will be prenatal diagnostic high risk pregnancies and invasive technologies. Hello, uh, good evening. Can you can you hear me and can you see the, my screen? Yes, yes we can. Yes, okay. Probably I, I, will, I am going to uh, switch off my camera because I think I have a problem with the connection and to move uh, forward in the, in the presentation. Then uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hamed, for the, for the nice presentation. Really, it's a pleasure for me to share this evening with you. And uh, we are going to talk in this last uh, webinar, in the, to close the webinar, about uh, prenatal diagnosis. Uh, the first uh, challenge of this talk is uh, how to talk about uh, modern prenatal genetic testing uh, in the, cost, the, the context of the classical prenatal diagnosis for uh, directed to the high-risk pregnancy and based on the uh, invasive uh, technologies. But um, I think it's not uh, very difficult to realize that at this moment we are living an amazing uh, genomic revolution uh, that uh, is impacting uh, very uh, strongly in, in all fields of the, of the medicine and uh, of course in, in the prenatal diagnosis. If we remember only a, a few decades uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, 90, in the uh, 50s, uh, we uh, use the first uh, amniocentesis to uh, identify the uh, 21 uh, trisomy, the, the syndrome of the Down, the, uh, Down syndrome uh, trisomy. And uh, in the 80s, we start with the first molecular technologies to analyze single gene disorders. And uh, in the beginning of the uh, 2000, uh, we start with the uh, FIS, uh, the, the, uh, FIS uh, technologies and Kiev PCR to identify aneuploidies, and at the end of the uh, 20, 2010, 
we use the, the prenatal uh, chromosome, we use the, the chromosome microarray technologies uh, for the first time to uh, analyze uh, prenatal fetus. Uh, this uh, progression uh, in, the, in the next generation sequencing was uh, very uh, fast and very quickly. Uh, if we start with the Human Genome Project in the 2003 and uh, a, very fast, uh, a very fast evolution of these technologies uh, for uh, the application for the uh, free, uh, cell-free uh, DNA to apply in the prenatal uh, diagnosis. Okay, this technology has, uh, the technology of next generation sequencing has uh, revolutionized, uh, has uh, performed a very uh, important revolution in the, in the prenatal uh, area and the prenatal diagnosis uh, because uh, provide millions of sequences and, and only one uh, essay. This is a, a very powerful technology that provides a lot of information uh, very fast and very uh, quick. At, but also at this moment uh, is a technology that, that can that provide uh, very, uh, all this information uh, in uh, reducing the, the, the decreasing the price uh, very fast. At this moment, uh, we can uh, say that uh, the next generation sequencing could be one of the most important driving force uh, for the genomic research and for example, if we apply all these technologies, uh, it's very important in diagnosis, it's very important what is the uh, main use of the clinical application uh, in, the, in, the, in the prenatal diagnosis. For example, it's very important that to know that uh, the next generation sequencing provides this uh, quantity of uh, information and is one of the main advantages of the technology, but also is one of the, uh, of the best disadvantages because provide a lot of information and access of genomic data that, uh, that uh, in the prenatal context with a very close uh, time for uh, provide results is very difficult sometimes to extract the clinical useful information. The interpretation, the interpretation of the data also should be uh, very difficult and uh, many times we can obtain a lot of uh, results that provide uncertainty to the patient. But also very important is the ethical issues in the prenatal, uh, in the prenatal time. I recommend this, uh, this, uh, to read this, uh, this article that discuss, uh, that discuss what is the main uh, concerns about the ethical questions in the prenatal uh, diagnosis, uh, providing from the, uh, the, from the use of the, uh, the technologies. Uh, the, the title of the of the of the, this paper is Pandora's pregnancy, uh, but uh, if you have uh, all if you have the access that we have at this moment with the, the technology. Uh, but the first question is uh, a very important question is who would resist not opening this box and to to see what is inside. This is the situation we are uh, having at this moment in the in the uh, prenatal diagnosis, and we need to know uh, and we need to. Uh, identify and, and, and to be clear, what is the uh, main objective of our test. For example, uh, the next generation sequencing is a very good approach to uh, identify new causes of, of, uh, of uh, genetic diseases, but uh, in research is very important, but the limitation are uh, difficult to, uh, we, we, we have a lot of uh, limitation to uh, offer this type of technology in the prenatal context. Uh, if we use uh, the technology for research, we need to follow the scientific method. We need to use this technology to corroborate a previous hypothesis uh, with the objective of discover something new or something so, uh, that can uh, surprise uh, to us. But in, in prenatal diagnosis, we don't need these, these, these surprises and these discoveries. And uh, this technology should be only uh, used uh, in the clinical settings for a diagnosis. In this case, uh, we use uh, the technology uh, to uh, analyze uh, clear uh, evidences previously proven by uh, scientific, uh, uh, scientific studies and 
In this case, we will focus on affected patients or patients with a higher a high risk, with the aim to provide a uh, roll out uh, evidence that has been proven previously by, by science. In this case, we will focus on, on this type of, of patients. We will fo uh, focus on affected patients uh, with a high risk and with the aim of probing or ruling out the, the evidence. And in this case, we need a very high accuracy and precision to, uh, to get these uh, objectives. In the case of screening, uh, we can use the technology uh, to identify a, a significant health risk in a large uh, population and for which we have an, an effective clinical procedure. And we will focus in this case on healthy patients uh, with a low or moderate risk. It's the case, for example, in the, the, the last presentation of Dr. Miguel Milan uh, for uh, the screening of uh, aneuploidies. This could be one of the most used algorithms in prenatal diagnosis. Uh, for example, in this, if we use the, the, the right branch uh, in diagnosis, we focus uh, the, 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 our test to the uh, high risk pregnancies because uh, we have identified this high risk by clinical evidences or by family story. And we follow uh, the, this, uh, this right branch and the right arm and we, uh, when we are faced uh, to a uh, pregnancy with a high risk, we recommend invasive pr uh, procedures to analyze the, the fetal samples with the objective of take, to get a, 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 an accurate diagnosis. Uh, for low risk, risk uh, pregnancies, uh, in this case for healthy pregnancies or for uh, pregnancies without uh, a family story, we will follow the screening programs uh, to prevent uh, mainly the congenital birth defects. Uh, and we will use the conventional screening test to uh, reassess this risk and to uh, classify uh, these um, previous uh, pregnancies with uh, low risk in low risk or high risk. And in the case we have identified or we have classified a new, uh, 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 an initial uh, pregnancy with a low risk with a high risk, we will, we will recommend also an invasive uh, procedure. In any case, uh, it's very important to uh, proceed to, to uh, have, to, to have uh, also pre-test and post-test genetic counseling uh, to discuss the risk, to, uh, to inform about the limitation and, the, uh, and how to manage all the information uh, that we can obtain from these uh, sometimes very complex technologies. In this case, uh, we are, we, in the case of the screening, uh, with the birth of the NGS technologies, uh, the paradigms are changing and we move from uh, this case in, in when uh, we have uh, the, the conventional uh, integrated screen uh, by, uh, by blood screen or for, by uh, uh, ultrasonography. We, we have moved to the new uh, technology based on cell-free DNA and we reducing the, the, the false positive rate, increasing the, data, the, detec the detection uh, rate and also decreasing significantly the number of invasive technologies and risks associated to these uh, technologies. With this uh, new change of paradigm, of paradigm uh, we introduce uh, the analysis of the cell-free fetal uh, DNA uh, as a first line uh, screening in many, uh, many contexts, as we, can, we have seen in our, previous, uh, in, a, in our previous presentation. From now on, uh, we are going to focus on this uh, high pregnancy, high risk pregnancy and the diagnostic based on, on, on invasive uh, technologies. And uh, the high risk pregnancy is mainly established by, by uh, screening programs and uh, by clinical evidence. The screening programs, we know uh, uh, pre uh, perfectly what are the, 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 the main uh, drivers for, to, to assess the, the risk is that the, the an advance in maternal age, the triple uh, marker screening or ultrasonographic screening about uh, looking for uh, some type of uh, echographical, ultrasonographical uh, markers. And in this case, the most risk, the, the majority of the risk associated to, uh, uh, to, to this type of, uh, of evidence are uh, chromosomal nebulous. But when we move to the clinical evidence, uh, the, uh, the number of the, uh, of the uh, features that could provide a, a high risk are uh, higher. And in this case, uh, for example, the adverse pregnancy evolution, family story uh, of some type of uh, genetic disease or, or high risk uh, 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 
probability to, to have a, a, a chromosomal uh, alteration and a specific ultrasonographic marker, markers or structural anomalies. In this case, the, uh, we need, uh, we have a very strong evidence about the, uh, about the, 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 the evolution of the pregnancy. And uh, we, the, the objective of this test is also to identify well, the most uh, chromosomal uh, uh, alteration, but also uh, in this case, more of the most of the technology, most of the uh, risk uh, are associated to a chromosomal alteration. But also, we are going to identify a single gene uh, alteration that can be uh, associated to other uh, type of risk that we and we can use another type of uh, technologies. Then uh, for prenatal diagnosis, uh, we need to uh, we need to use the, the, the we need to apply a, a, a invasive technology to obtain a fetal sample uh, only when the risk of the genetic the, the genetic risk we want uh, to avoid is higher than the uh, risk associated to the invasive technology we are going to to use. In this case, also as you know, uh, the, main, the, the main invasive procedures are the chorionic virus sampling, the amniocentesis, the cordocentesis, and in the, with this type of technologies, we obtain different type of uh, samples: uh, 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 amniotic fluid, uh, uh, virus sample, or uh, blood. And uh, with this uh, type of samples, we can uh, do a, a, a cell culture to uh, obtain a, the karyotyping of the of the uh, set, uh, fetal cells, or we can extract the DNA to uh, uh, to obtain and to analyze the uh, the DNA uh, using uh, the rest of technology, uh, chromosomal microarray, gene analysis, and GS. Uh, it's very important to know that uh, from uh, cell culture cultures we can obtain DNA, but uh, from the DNA we are not able to uh, obtain a, a karyotype because we have, we for the extraction of DNA, we can we have to uh, destroy the the cells. With this uh, type of samples, we will do the karyotyping uh, when we want to analyze the structure and the or the uh, numeric uh, uh, alteration of the chromosomes. Uh, we can uh, we follow this uh, band this uh, uh, this uh, the, the structure of the chromosomes, and uh, the objective is to identify. Uh, small deletions, uh, translocations, inversions, or uh, translocation of uh, acrocentric uh, chromosomes. The chromosomal microarray, uh, the objective is to identify uh, numeric anomalies of the genome. Uh, in this case, we are using uh, molecular technologies, and with this technology, we improve the sensibility, we improve the, sens the resolution of the technology, and we, and we are able to uh, also to zoom in in the technology and to analyze what are the genes uh, involved in the uh, deletion or duplication we have uh, identified. This technology is a technology uh, um, that we use for, uh, at this moment is the gold standard for, uh, for the detection of copy number variation or an aneuploidy in, in most of the uh, clinical situations. And the other uh, technology we, when we are going to use for uh, once uh, we have the, 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 the fetal sample uh, from the uh, obtained by, by invasive uh, technologies is the gene analysis. In this situation, uh, the molecular genetic diagnosis is very complex and uh, many times it's very personalized. Uh, why? Because we, ha we have a very wide range of different type of mutations, point mutations, and insertion or deletions, expansions, and also because it's very frequent to have uh, to identify Private uh, mutation that only uh, occurs in a in a in a in a family, and is the first time we have identified this mutation that we probably never will be will be will be detect uh, again. The uh, uh, the genetic heterogeneity is also very high. Uh, we can found mutation in different genes that cause that can cause the the same phenotype, or mutation in the same gene that that, that can cause uh, different phenotypes. In these cases. It's very important to have a clinical orientation uh, to, uh, because we need to uh, provide an answer to some question. What is the uh, mutation or what is the, the region we, are, we want to analyze? Where is the position in the, in the uh, genome uh, we need uh, to uh, apply our technology? 
are what is the, the, the main technology, the most appropriate technology we are going to use. The, good, uh, the, the most important um, feature of this type of technology is that, that provide a very high specificity, a very high sensitivity, but the complexity also is very high. We have to know that the, uh, the genome is, uh, is uh, very, very uh, we have uh, 3,300 uh, 3, million of uh, characters in, in each of, in, in each of uh, our cells. Uh, if we compare uh, this uh, number of characters with uh, a book, for example, the Kixot, uh, we have uh, we need more than 1,300 uh, books to include the same number of characters we have in, in the genome of, of each of our uh, cells. With this technology, we need to know we, we need to know the that what are the most appropriate technology for each type of uh, mutation. For example, for deletions, MLPA, other blood sequencing for trinucleotide uh, expansions, sequencing, uh, and also the next generation sequencing provide uh, data from the, uh, from the, the DNA the sequence of, uh, of, of each of, of, of many of the, of, our, of the genes that we want to analyze. The next generation sequencing probably is the uh, most accurate option uh, when uh, a phenotype is present. In this case, we will uh, provide uh, precision panels uh, driven for the, by the genotype. We need to have a, 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 an accurate uh, clinical orientation to, to know what is the most appropriate uh, panel we want to, uh, to, uh, to use uh, for, for each, each case. And, but also we can analyze, uh, we can use the, the wall exome sequencing to analyze uh, the, 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 the fetal samples and is the probably the most powerful option uh, when we don't have a specific uh, orienta a clinical orientation on, or a specific phenotype in uh, in the in the with the diagnosis. If we uh, make an analogy with uh, with Google Maps, we know very well what is Google Map. Uh, for example, the karyotyping will be the <clears throat> the wall uh, uh, the, the, the the map of the world and. Uh, the chromosomal microarray, uh, we can zoom in in the region uh, we want to analyze. In this case, is Valencia, the, the place where are the headquarters in, of iGenomics. But uh, if we want uh, to use uh, genetic analysis and molecular technologies, we need to include in the browser a very concrete uh, uh, or a clinical orientation about what is the, the, the issue, the question that we want to, to analyze. In this case, uh, I have included iGenomics Dubai and we are we can go there, but uh, probably we can, uh, if we only uh, include iGenomics, we can go to another places in, in the world. By NGS, by next generation sequencing, we obtain uh, a lot of pictures from uh, Google Streets, from uh, a lot of places. And the only question and the only uh, uh, disadvantage is that we need uh, to use uh, complex uh, uh, informatic tools to uh, classify all these pictures and to map in the uh, uh, reference map uh, that we are using. In this case is Spain, but we can use uh, uh, the, 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 as a reference our uh, genome. And uh, summarizing, uh, the best way to provide a complete service uh, of prenatal diagnosis is to offer as much uh, technologies as possible to be able to, to deal with any genetic uh, risk or any genetic disease we have in our prenatal uh, cases. Let me introduce this, um, this paper as it's a very recent uh, and, and a very impo uh, interesting uh, paper about the use of uh, prenatal exome uh, sequencing uh, in, 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 the, in the context of uh, prenatal uh, uh, high-risk uh, pregnancies. In this case, they have, uh, have classified uh, all the, 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 the cases uh, according to the uh, structural anomalies that I, uh, they have found in the, in, the, in the patients. And one of the most important things is the diagnostic uh, deal that they have obtained in, uh, with these cases. We have a lot of uh, references about the, the, the diagnostic re uh, deal are very different because uh, they provide, uh, uh, they, they came from different uh, sources with a small series, but I think the most interesting uh, data is uh, this, uh, this paper of Monaghan, uh, in which uh, they uh, explain that the 6% of the uh, fetus with only an, one uh, anomaly 
uh, can be uh, can we obtain a, a, a genetic diagnosis and up uh, 30 uh, 35 percent of the fetus with more than more uh, anomaly for the use of uh, exome sequencing in in, in prenatal uh, we have also some type of uh, guidelines or uh, best practice uh, 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 references and uh, they say that uh, for example for the use of uh, fetus with uh, f uh, with ultrasound anomalies uh, the chromosomal microarray is uh, still the first option. Uh, at, we can detect approximately the four, six uh, percent of the cases. The wall exome sequencing only is uh, recommended when a diagnostic is, is suspected, when we have some, uh, uh, some evidences about one type of uh, phenotype. Uh, in this case, the uh, wall exome se uh, sequences uh, they recommend that must be uh, driven by by the phenotype. Uh, the trio, the, the analysis of both uh, both parents, uh, the, the, the the fetal sample and the, the maternal and paternal samples, increase the diagnostic re, uh, deal, uh, probably because it provide more evidences about the uh, interpretation. It's very important to uh, provide an appropriate pre, an appropriate uh, pretest and post-test genetic counseling. It's very important also uh, because these technologies are very complex to have a, a very short uh, turnaround times. Uh, we need to know, uh, we need to previously uh, the clinical, the technical limitation of each uh, technology and to have clear reporting policies about uh, the uh, variance of uncertain significance and uh, inside dental phoenix that are very common in the, in the analysis of uh, the wall exome uh, sequencing. And also to take into account uh, some ethical uh, issues related to consanguinity or, or paternities. And to, uh, to finalize with, a, with this uh, presentation, I, I would like to, uh, to, to present this, uh, some, ca some case reports that we have uh, performed during the, the, the last months. Is, in this case, is a, a, a pregnancy uh, with a renal cyst and encephalocele, polydactylia, and a positive family story. And they uh, provide a, 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 a clinical orientation about uh, towards to the Meckel-Gruber syndrome. In this case, we have used a, a, a tool uh, and, it, and that we have the, the developed in genomics that we can search for the phenotypes. We can search for the uh, omin reference and the human phenotype ontologies and to identify what is the, be, the best uh, set of genes that uh, are related to the uh, described uh, phenotype. In this case, we know also what is the performance, uh, the sequencing performance, the quality metrics, and the coverage of each uh, gene, uh, each of the genes in the in the panel. And uh, finally, we can, in, in this case, we have uh, able to to identify the genetic cause of this disease, the TCTN2 uh, uh, gene. Uh, it was identified in, in amyloidosis and is related. Uh, to the uh, synd uh, mega syndrome at age type uh, eight. In this case, the variant uh, has been classified as pathogenic, and we, do we don't have any doubt about the the, uh, the diagnosis in this in this case. This is another case, uh, complex also because is uh, uh, they have a, lo a lot of uh, multiple abnormal ultrasonography uh, features, and in this case we have identified uh, a, a very large duplication uh, by NGS. The NGS is not the uh, gold standard technology for identification of this type of uh, variants. This is a, a trisomy of the uh, 13 chromosome, uh, the Apatow uh, syndrome, and uh, what have been uh, checked and have been uh, comprobated, uh, checked by another technologies to identify that the, uh, the trisomy uh, 13 is, is, is present. And, uh, and this case is the, uh, the case three, is uh, another uh, prenatal case, a uh, uh, fetus with, uh, with anhydramnios, bilateral echogenic lungs, and antenatal anal scan. This is a case performed by our colleagues in, in Dubai. And uh, in this case, I have been identified uh, two uh, variants in the, in the FR, FR, FRS, FRS1 uh, gene. One uh, clearly pathogenic, but the other is uh, a, a variant that, that has been 
classify as, as a variant of a certain significance. But in this case, the, the diagnostic is very, the clinical diagnostic is clear, and uh, this variant uh, should be reclassified, uh, taking in consideration uh, the parental uh, segregation of the, of the variant. And this is the, uh, the, the last uh, case. It's a case uh, with hypotonia, global development uh, delay, seizures, hypomelitation, hypomelitation. In, in this case, it's a, a newborn uh, case. And uh, we have it identified by uh, next generation sequencing, by uh, wall exome sequencing, uh, a deletion of uh, uh, five uh, megabase that has been uh, related, associated to the uh, Angelman syndrome. Uh, we have associated to Angelman syndrome because the uh, clinical uh, features are compatible with this syndrome, with syndromes. And as conclusion, we can identify and we uh, get the diagnosis of this patient by NGS. As uh, summarizing, uh, sorry, I don't know. Okay, summarizing is very important to uh, to obtain the, to the the risk assessment of the patient uh, to uh, with all the information, the clinical information and the uh, data from the uh, for the evolution of the pregnancy to identify to to select what are the best technology uh, we have to use uh, to obtain an accurate genetic diagnosis. Uh, that uh, and to use this information to the decision making of the of the patient and as a conclusion to the, the, the main take home messages we have to explain today is uh, the clinical evolution for the uh, is very important for the effective management of this uh, complexity of this type of cases uh, the most appropriate technology uh, must be uh, determined by the clinical evidences uh, that we have obtained by the uh, familial history and the, uh, the evolution of the pregnancy. It's very important that uh, in some countries it's mandatory to provide a pre-test and post-test genetic counseling. The analytical and clinical validation of these uh, complex and, and powerful technologies are, is very important uh, and we have a lot of international guidelines to follow uh, and to uh, to apply in, in our uh, setting. It's very important in the prenatal uh, field uh, the, to plan uh, and anticipate uh, the problems before uh, the, 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 the invasive technology has been performed. It's very important also to, uh, to manage uh, with, uh, with all the data and the knowledge uh, we have, for example, in the case of NGS with the uh, variant of Arsentine uh, significance. We need to minimize, uh, minimize the, the, the uncertainty and uh, to take into account uh, the ethical issues and the patient involvement of, the, of these, uh, these results. And uh, also it's very important to, to, uh, to work in multidisciplinary teams, uh, working together with obstetrician, genetic counselor and geneticist, and to put together all the information, uh, all the technical information and all the clinical, all the clinical information. Thank you very much, and uh, um, this is all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hafer. I um, would like actually to remind our audience that uh, this panel, we had our three speakers. The first actually was uh, Dr. Nasser Al-Asma, who actually presented a miscarriage analysis, then followed by the presentation of Dr. Miguel Milan, who presented the prenatal screening using non-invasive genetic testing. And finally, the topic, last topic was prenatal diagnostic high-risk pregnancies and invasive uh, genetic testing by Dr. Javier uh, Garcia. Uh, just actually to mention one thing, which is, uh, well, as, as mentioned by our colleagues, things are always developing and evolving and changing. And uh, we always say uh, we have to, to follow exactly what is what is been happening now. We remember the time of triple test and then the quadruple test and then yeah, the time or the era of early anomalies, ultrasound scan, and then actually combining all together and so on. At the end, actually, every couple, every mother would like uh, to have her rights preserved. Uh, first right, the right to know. Uh, the second right is the right to choose, uh, especially when the testing is non-invasive. Uh, and I would wonder actually what will happen to the CVS with time. 
and again, you know, the option for termination. Uh, all these things actually are very important. Do we need to screen them all? What is the harm if a mother would come, even if she's a low risk, even if there is like no real worry and she would like to be tested? So all these things are uh, important questions. Uh, we'll go to our uh, questions uh, from the audience and uh, we'll start by, first of all, there's one question. Will this record or this panel record be available? I, I I think so, Dr. Ahmad. I think that this is being recorded, and actually, with the list of uh, people that attended to this webinar, uh, we can send the, the link so they come uh, after one or two days. They can follow uh, the link to to watch again if if they want it. Sure, excellent. Uh, among the question is, uh, do you perform fetal genotype of RH D in NIPT? No, the answer is is no. We we don't do this kind of analysis. Okay, for Dr. Nasser, how frequent do you think we should uh, do genetic testing if we have 500 cycles a year? Genetic testing means the the analysis of of the embryos. I yes. guess. Yes. Well, uh, I think that we should go for the indications uh, because um, obviously there's uh, some indications to perform the PGTA, the chromosomal analysis, such as advanced maternal age or recurrent implantation failure, recurrent miscarriage, uh, severe male factor, previous chromosomopathy. Also can do for gender selection and why, why not to perform with uh, good prognosis patients that you want to do a single embryo transfer. So just to be sure that you are transferring this, the, the embryo that has higher chances to, uh, to get a pregnant patient and then to have a healthy baby. Because at the end, we don't want to have a, a, a patient that is pregnant, but we want it's a healthy baby at home. So this is, exactly. uh, it, it depends on, on, on the clinic. Obviously we do know that in the US they perform a lot of uh, a lot of PETA, in Europe it's a little bit less, and I, I would go for the indications. If you have a, a kind of patients in your clinic, even 500 cycles or 1,000 cycles, but there's mostly advanced maternal age, and with those kind of indications, I would recommend to all of those patients that, that has this kind of indications. Sure. If we have a vanishing twin, I think actually this been uh, this been mentioned, but we'll, it's, it's it's okay to to um, to uh, say it. If we have a vanishing twin at nine weeks, when is the uh, proper time to perform NACE for the second twin and having the most accurate result? Well, this is a tricky question because um, uh, you know um, many times what happens is that the vanishing twin arrested early in pregnancy at week five, six, seven, up to seven, something like that. In our experience, we, we have few experience with fetuses being arrested in week uh, nine or 10 and requesting an IPT. Uh, I remember a case and um, the women wanted to perform an IPT at week 11. We did recommend it, this kind of analysis because you know that there is a dynamic. So the, the fetus could arrest at, at week nine but uh, but there is a dynamic, uh, there is a release, a quick release in the first part of the, uh, you know, when the baby is arrested uh, and this DNA is contaminating the, the blood, the maternal bloodstream. And we detected at 11 because she insisted in, she, uh, you know, acknowledged the risk of testing at that, in this situation. We detected at trisomy 18. And uh, well, we offer her the opportunity to wait because in Spain, we, the, you know, the, the legal term to terminate the pregnancy is week 22. And uh, we offer her the opportunity to test in week 18. So we have enough time to perform an amniocentesis in case we detect it again. The, uh, the, the trisomy 18 was detected again. And uh, at week 18, you know, uh, we didn't see anything about trisomy 18. So with this delay of about eight weeks, eight, nine, ten weeks, uh, is in this case, in this specific case, was time enough to, you know, to clear the contaminating DNA. But you have to realize that this is n equal to one, and you have know that uh, the variety, the variability that you can you can find in the population is quite high. 
So our recommendations are always uh, with cases in which the the baby or the fetus, the sac, has arrested early in pregnancy. When it's too late, uh, well, this is a risk that we don't recommend to perform an IPT. So this is if the woman uh, want to to acknowledge the risk and test, go ahead. We can find something, and if we find something, we are going to classify the case of high risk, and you know, with all the implications. But for us, it's too late. With nine, ten, it's too late to manage properly the case with the okay. knowledge we have so far. Okay. What is the lowest fetal fraction to get uh, an accurate NIPT result? This is a tricky question. So this is a, a very tricky question. It depends on the technology that you are using. So, uh, for example, you have platforms in which uh, the threshold is four percent. That means that you know the 95% coefficient of interference is, is detecting efficiently the uh, the trisomies you want to detect or the conditions you want to detect. And for some for some uh, platforms is this is 4%, and for two pregnancy 8%. Uh, working with the platform that we have in the headquarters in Valencia, uh, we've uh, checked by empirical experiments that we can detect effectively. Um, all the trisomies 21, the chromosome 21 is the, is the smaller one and is the more complicated to be detected. And we can uh, get a good detection uh, up to 2% fetal fraction. Below 2% fetal fraction, you can lose some cases and we don't, we don't uh, release any, any result because we, we think we, you know, the, the performance could be bad in this range, okay? Great, and as you mentioned, actually, uh, in your presentation, that like a single gene uh, uh, defects, you know, it's like, especially like with thalassemia, sickling, and so on, the future actually is really promising us with with like uh, many, uh, I would say, uh, many advantages. At the end, actually, of uh, of our talk, I would like to thank the three of you for uh, for this excellent uh, uh, activity and panel, and I would like also to thank all our audience who are with us. And we hope in the future to have um, more uh, illustrations and more uh, what what to enrich the uh, the practitioners and the public about the uh, development of genes and genomes and the evolution of medicine that is really making uh, making the suffering less, making the accuracy more, and the hope actually really based on 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 true. A reassurance of testing and diagnosis. Thank you so much, doctors. We really actually enjoyed uh, your presence and participation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sure. Dr. Rahman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a good Thank night. You. you too.